Hello and welcome to my channel. My name's Amanda and I'm happy that you're here. Today we are continuing our series of reading out of our 100 Wild Little Weird Tales, an anthology of spooky stories that my parents gifted me one Christmas growing up. And I thought it would be fun to randomly revisit some of the stories with you all. So this is the third story that we've read out of this book so far. I completed a random number generator and got the number 41. So today we will be reading His Brother's Keeper by Captain George Fielding Elliott. So grab a beverage, kick back, and let's dive in. His Brother's Keeper by Captain George Fielding Elliott. John Dangerfield was in love with his brother's fiance. A position whose difficulties were somewhat ameliorated by the fact that from early childhood, he had been accustomed to take away from his brother Horace any of Horace's possessions that he fancied. And oddly enough, he had always fancied what Horace cherished most. Now he fancied Leslie Monroe, and that blonde young lady was by no means unconscious of the fact, nor was she unconscious of the difference between being the wife of a younger son, a mere pensioner, and being the wife to the heir of Cragmore. She stood now by John's side in a dusty room on the third story of an old brick warehouse, listening to the chatter of a gray little man in a skull cap. The room was filled with odds and ends of every description over which the little gray man waxed eloquently. This armor is really remarkable, the gray little man was saying. But if you aren't interested in that, Mr. Dangerfield, here's something that will strike your fancy. It's the queerest thing I've had here for many a day. I found it in Nuremberg, and I've had it restored and put in good order. He had paused before an object that looked like an upended sarcophagus. It was a little taller than a full-grown man, and entirely of iron. On his front it bore a bas-relief of a female figure. It was perhaps three feet wide and twice as deep. Looks like a deep coffin stood on end, John Dangerfield remarked. Right, the dealer replied. Look here. He swung the back of the thing out on heavy hinges like a door. At the bottom of this door was a stout shelf of iron. Above this was fitted an assortment of iron bands, hinged and provided with locks. The dealer flashed the ray of a pocket torch into the dark interior. Protruding back from its forward wall, Leslie and Dangerfield saw six long tapering iron spikes, glittering and sharp. This, the gray little man gloated, is a genuine iron maiden. It is 400 years old, built especially to the order of Duke Otho of Franconia. That whole front is movable, moves back into the box at the rate of about a half an inch per every 10 minutes, propelled by steel springs of incredible power. You put your victim against this door, standing on the shelf, and fasten him tight with the iron bands. The man can't move a muscle when they're all locked. Then you swing the door shut. So, putting your victim facing the spikes. A touch on this lever releases the mechanism, and the spikes move towards him. They're over a foot away to start with. Gives him plenty of time to think over his sins. Note the spikes. The two bottom ones are the longest and are supposed to pierce the groin or lower abdomen. Then, when they are well embedded, the next two pierce the shoulders. Finally, the last two pierce the poor devil's eyes, reach his brain at last, and put him out of his misery. I fancy the whole process takes about six hours. From the time the machinery commences to the move until the victim is dead. What a horrible, dreadful thing, John! Leslie Monroe exclaimed. 
Please take me away. I can't bear to look at it. Just as you say, dear, John Dangerfield answered tenderly. We'll be going now, Nathan. I may be back to see you later. Monday, if you please, Mr. Dangerfield, the little gray man answered. It's Saturday afternoon, sir. I'm closing up. He opened the door leading to the dark landing. The man who had been so patiently waiting there in the shadows struck one savage blow and lowered the limp body of the dealer gently to the floor. What's the matter, Nathan? John Dangerfield asked, hearing the thud of the blow. There was no answer. John in his turn stepped out upon the landing, and again the watcher in the shadow struck. The blackjack did its work well. John Dangerfield collapsed in a crumpled heap beside the dealer. The man who had struck him stepped over his body into the storeroom to confront Leslie Monroe. Why, Horace, she cried, what are you? Then the light from the window fell full upon his face, his eyes. Then Leslie Monroe fainted. Horace Dangerfield laughed, the cunning, <laughs> triumphant laugh of a madman. I've waited long, he muttered, too long. Nothing has been adequate before, but this, this will do. This will satisfy me. When John Dangerfield came to himself, he was in a dust-filled darkness. He could not move. Something was choking him. Something was an iron collar locked tight about his neck. His forehead was held back by an iron band. His wrists and ankles were in manacles. There was a dreadful clanking sound somewhere in the gloom. Warm against his breast, he felt living flesh. He realized that Leslie Monroe was there, bound tightly to him by straps or ropes. He spoke her name, but she did not answer. The truth leapt upon John Dangerfield like a pouncing tiger. He was locked in the Iron Maiden, with Leslie Monroe bound before him so the spikes would reach her first. He raised his voice, Help! Help! The words reverberated mockingly in that iron tomb. Even more mockingly, a voice from without answered, Cry again, John. There is no one to hear, save the Iron Maiden. I was listening last night when you told Leslie you wanted to be with her even in death. You have your wish. Goodbye, John. Horace, for the love of God! But only the sound of retreating feet and the slamming of a door answered. The machinery clanked again, and the first cruel touch of the steel points revived the swooning Leslie. The gloomy room rang with a woman's screams. And that's the end. That was a short one today, girly pops. Short, sweet, brutal, to the point. Don't steal things that don't belong to you. Or you will be put in an Iron Maiden saw style. Okay? Like, uh, duh. <laughs> it's sad that we have to have horror stories that say, hey, don't be mean to your brother. Don't steal his girl or he will kill you Cain versus Abel style. What, what is society? Nothing really changes, does it? So what did you think, dear listener? Did you like it? I liked it. I thought it was short, sweet, and to the point. I mean... It really just lays it out for you. Tell me what you thought in the comments below. If you liked this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more wild little weird tales coming in the future. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. And reader beware, you might be in for a good listen. Just kidding. <laughs> so I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.